Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our topic is going to be headaches. Now I'm just going to primarily focus on headaches and not migraines. Um, headaches are caused by various different reasons and the multitude, there's much more probably than what I even have written on here. But what they basically are is irregular attacks of pain in various parts of the head or the sinus cavities. And probably the most common ones are going to be due to tension and stress or allergy or sinus issues. Um, when we look at causes, they're numerous. So sometimes it's very difficult for a physician to diagnose <laughs> where to go from on here. So I'm going to give you uh, some of the causes and then for you to kind of attach what you normally feel based upon the causes are going to be what your treatment is going to be. So it's a little bit complex, but getting bottom line to the cause is always the best way to do it. Probably one of the most common is going to be a cervical or spinal, and you have to pardon me, my spelling for some reason, I have like four or five spelling mistakes, but a spinal or cervical, that will be right up here in the upper part where you'll be misaligned or out of adjustment or have a degenerating disc, you'll find that you'll get headaches that'll shoot and be all in the back of the skull. And oftentimes those can become chronic. A good chiropractor can also help with that um, in, in getting the circula circulation flowing better into the spine and then some of the supplements we're going to talk about later on as far as maintaining your circulatory. Muscle spas spasms in the base of the skull, neck, and shoulder tension. Especially for people who are leaning over in their job all the time, writing or typing or that type of thing, or if they hold a lot of shoulder stress, that'll lend itself to a lot of headaches that come from the base of the skull, the neck, and up right to the back of the head. Um, stress, oh man, stress headaches can <laughs> emulate anywhere in the head, but oftentimes we'll notice we'll start rubbing right here when we get a lot of stress and tension, you'll see people kind of go like this or like this. Stress uh, causes uh, certain changes in our body that induce uh, headache formation. Blood sugars, oh man, if I watch my blood sugars drop, I'm hypoglycemic, that can trigger a headache overall in me and make me kind of off balance and all. I experienced that a little bit today. And so therefore, necessary to probably eat four to five consistent smaller meals per day if you have blood sugar issues, keeping the sugars at a nor more normal uh, basis. Hormones, particularly uh, with women who have PMS or PMS times or during uh, perimenopausal or menopause. The increase of, t of uh, estrogens and the decrease of progesterones can trigger headaches or just the various imbalances of the hormones and thyroid hormones as well too. Sleep, that's a big one. Considering the majority of working women and most of the men are not getting enough sleep. That can make you off balance, kind of make you almost numb and almost in a drunken state and can trigger headaches. Digestive problems. So, you know, you don't think of your digestive, uh, digestive system as contributing to headaches, but when your body's holding on to a lot of toxins or you're not having adequate bowel movements, those toxins flow back to the body, into the head. Oh, yeah. That can actually cause uh, chronic, chronic headaches. Uh, diseases of the eye, ear, nose, and throat, sinuses, and teeth. I had a customer recently, we couldn't figure out why she was having a chronic hear and sinuses. She wasn't having any uh, green coming from the nasal passage, it just didn't look like an infection, but lo and behold, she had a tooth in which a cap was coming loose and she would, didn't re experience any pain, but there was an infection going up inside. So your teeth can affect all those areas as well. Sometimes what appears to be one area causing you pain is something else causing it. Medications or drugs, there are certain medications that can contribute certain high blood pressure medications, uh, painkillers, lots of meds. I could go on with the list that can trigger headaches. As a matter of fact, what I find is almost half of the medications out there have a potential side effect of having headaches. Chemical uh, or foods or additives like MSG, sulfites that you're going to find in like processed meats like hot dogs, lunch meat and fermented foods. Chemical reactions, I know for me, if I get something with MSG, it'll send me in an instant headache, just right about here. And 
I had that actually experience that just a teeny bit last night after I had a burger from a local establishment. Boom, I had just a slight bit of a headache and then ended up with a little bit of an allergy from it too. But it triggered from whatever additives were added maybe in the sauces or the ketchup or MSG, which I'm real sensitive to. So you have to be mindful when you look at packaging and you see sulfites in MSG and you're sensitive to it, it's also found in wine and some of our alcoholic beverages as well too. That can trigger headaches. Uh, alcohol can trigger headaches, obviously, uh, because it's a vaso relaxer, but then you can get vasoconstriction. Uh, so it's that back and forth motion that can trigger headaches, and then it also messes with, with blood sugars as well. Uh, uh, tyramine rich foods, oh God, there's a lot of them. Peanuts, certain nuts, certain uh, coffee, chocolate, those types of foods can trigger headaches. So if you're sensitive uh, to tyramine, you have to avoid them. Coffee. Now it's interesting because coffee is oftentimes considered a cure for headaches because it causes vasoconstriction. The problem is as soon as the caffeine wears off, boom, you have instant vasodilation and it can set the body off. And if anybody's ever tried to get off coffee uh, or taper off, oh man, oftentimes in the morning you'll wake up with a headache. So any type of uh, narcotic, you know, caffeine, uh, any of those types of uh, cigarettes that we see, nicotine, all of those types of narcotic types of drugs can trigger that. Anemia and B vitamin deficiencies can trigger it because obviously if you don't have enough, <laughs> enough blood to carry your iron and, and the oxygen circulating, that can trigger headaches. Dehydration and electrolytes. This is very common among athletes. They'll think they're fine and then all of a sudden they end up with blare and headache. Now, there is an interesting issue uh, that I experienced with a, a client, uh, a, a customer of mine that was a client of one of our trainers. The lady would start exercising and immediately she would get a headache. Now, I shipped her off to the doc because the concern is, is when you get headaches right at the start of exercise, it can mean that we've got a little bit of heart issues going on. You're not circulating your blood very well. And immediately when you're starting to exercise, even though the blood pressure shows normal, it can mean that you've got circulatory issues. So I shoved her off to the doc. So before you exercise, always try and get some clearance from your doc or have a doc aware of what you're doing because this can trigger and it can be dangerous. Uh, obviously, if you have severe headaches that don't go away and they're chronic, you need to go into your doc because it can be tumors, it can be medication issues, it can be lots and lots of things. So if it's a chronic issue, you need to go into your doc or your healthcare practitioner if you have a naturopathic doctor and try and determine what potentially could be the continual cause of headaches. Um, as far as diet is concerned, I've listed here some of the uh, tyramine foods, wine, cheese, citrus, chocolate, coffee, soda, and the caffeine-rich foods. You're going to want to avoid these, obviously, because they cause an extreme fluctuation. I can go into the norepinephrine and all that kind of discussion as far as the issues with, with uh, tyramine and caffeine-rich foods, but I'm not going to do that. The key is, is they trigger circulatory constriction, dilation, which can in turn trigger headaches. What you want to do if you have a chronic headache issue is you always want to keep your blood sugar stable. So what that means is you want to have a meal or small meals throughout the day, and this is great for weight loss as well too, that are protein, have a little bit of fats and a little bit of carbs and fibers. So those balance of four things will keep your sugars more stable, give you energy and fuel for the brain, and you're gonna feel awake, have more energy, and you're gonna be much less likely to see the fluctuations in that dilation and constriction of the blood vessels based upon blood sugars and other chemical reactions. Uh, chewing gum. People who are chronic gum chewers oftentimes end up with more headaches. Now that could be issues with TMJ and other issues, but that continual oxygen, that weird oxygen exchange when you're chewing gum can actually leave you oxygen deprived. So if you've got those gum chewers all the time, it can actually deprive you of oxygen. So be aware, that's probably not a good idea if you suffer from chronic headaches. Ice beverages, because when you drink iced uh, things, you know, anytime you're talking about ice, you could get a vasoconstriction immediately and then you're gonna go back and forth with the dilation and constriction. So avoid iced beverages if you tend to have headaches. 
Uh, and then obviously we mentioned the foods with the chemicals. Avoid them. You know, whenever you can shop natural or make your own things from scratch or get organic, please, by all means, do. Because you're not going to be dealing with the, the question of whether or not chemicals could be causing your headaches. When we're talking about headaches, especially stress headaches, and particularly this time of the year when we're, when we're talking about holidays, um, at least 30 minutes a day of exercise is really going to increase the circulation, help get rid of the stress hormones, and relax a lot of your muscles. You're going to get a good circulation, vasoconstriction and dilation. You're going to get that flexibility of the vascular system that's so necessary. So please, particularly uh, during stressful times, try and get that little bit of exercise, even if it's just walking the dog at a brisk a walk every day. Very helpful. Now, when we're talking about supplements, man, these vary depending on the type of headache that you have. Um, so I've written some down on here that I know basic for basic headaches that can be very helpful. But there are specific types of supplements that can help with specific types of headaches. And, and I'll tell you, in the books I had, I found, I think I counted 40 different types of headaches that people suffer. And each of them has a slightly different treatment. So these are just some things that you can do to kind of hedge your bet and keep headaches away. A good multiple high in Bs. Uh, or in addition, a B-complex uh, added into that. That can also be helpful for migraine headaches, but that helps you deal with physiological stress. So if you have a stressful job or you have uh, stress because you exercise a lot or stress because of emotional issues or whatever it is, or that you're not getting enough sleep, a good multiple that's got a lot of extra Bs will help you physiologically deal with stress. Calcium, magnesium. Now, I like a balance of that, and particularly the citrate forms, because magnesium and calcium work together for constriction and relaxation, and they won't, you won't see such extremes. Oftentimes, when people are magnesium deficient, they'll only get vasoconstriction, and they'll have continual headaches. Or if they don't have enough calcium, they can get too much vasodilation. So a nice balance of calcium and magnesium can be help, very helpful for prevention of headaches. Um, cluster headaches, and there's a lot of studies, those are people, you know, where it's all over the brain, and sometimes these are even measurable by the docs when they do uh, scans. Uh, there were some good studies on L-tyrosine, L L-glutamine, and quercetin combinations of 500 milligrams each to help with cluster headaches. Vitamin E. Remember how we talked about the gum chewers and <laughs> the poor circulation? Well, remember the brain requires oxygen. So if you're a cigarette smoker or any, anything in which you feel your body is uh, lacking oxygen, and you know, that'll oftentimes show up in blood work that your doctor will do. It'll say your, your uh, CO2 and then your O2 oxygen levels. You can kind of know whether or not your body is carrying oxygen very well. Vitamin E slightly thins the blood, and it also helps with oxygenation. We oftentimes use it in COPD to help with uh, oxygenation. Borjol progesterone cream. To get specific on the dosages depends on the person, but for women who have or who are estrogen dominant and progesterone deficient or who have extreme fluctuations in hormones, they will find that trigger of headaches, particularly around their, uh, just before their period during times of PMS, but when you're perimenopause, you can experience it all the time, which makes it hell for everybody around you. So there are some ways that we can help balance out some of those hormones. Ginger and cayenne, uh, cayenne, as long as you don't have arthritis, ginger and cayenne are hot herbs, and along with turmeric, that are very good for the circulation. They get things moving and rolling, and oftentimes we'll use that in Raynard syndrome. To, those are people who you oftentimes will see blue fingers and toes. That can help with circulation. Vimpocetine increases uh, cerebral flow uh, for oxygen to the brain. It comes from extracts of periwinkle, which can be very helpful in like a five milligram dosage a couple of times a day. That can help thins the blood though, so you have to watch it if you're on aspirin therapy. There are tons of homeopathic remedies out there. Um, I know I brought a sample of one in and I'll show you when I'm gonna demonstrate uh, some of the uh, exercises and things we can do when we get headaches uh, out there. I've listed a few other herbs on here as well and dl aniline which we oftentimes is used to help kill pain. Now it's an amino acid that you take on an empty stomach that raises your endorphin levels and just like exercise when you raise your endorphin levels it can help you kill pain. These other herbs have been used for centuries for headaches. Centuries. 
So they're, they're time tested and some of them are antispasmodic, valerian calms and settles the nerves down. Uh, and feverfew helps and aids uh, with some vasoregulation in combination with magnesium and vitamin B2. There are actually formulas out there for migraines in which feverfew is used. Now, maintaining vascular health, we mentioned vitamin Bs. Well, vitamin C, second most important supplement that you can take if you have chronic headaches because it maintains the vascular flexibility. If you get hardening of the arteries, because you're borderline scurvy, which I think a good portion of the population has, then you're not going to ever see any proper uh, constriction or dilation of the blood vessels, and that can lend itself to poor circulatory and increase in headaches. Now, what's interesting is I know a lot of people grab aspirin, Tylenol, acetaminophen, uh, and other uh, type of pain meds in order to help them with their headaches. The only problem with that is that can often make, and that should be a C, chronic headaches worse because it can interfere with the body's own natural ability to fight headaches and pain. So I scratch my head a little bit. I know a lot of docs are recommending aspirin therapy, but be mindful, if a person has chronic headaches, this could be increasing their inability to fight off pain or if they have chronic pain. So being aware of that, discuss that with your doc if you have chronic headaches. I hope this helps. If you need a little bit more details, uh, you can research it on your own. And I do have books that you can uh, look at and refer to for research on headaches. Next, we're going to be uh, going into the fitness portion of our show, and I'm going to be showing you some exercises that you can use for headaches. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show and today I'm going to demonstrate a couple of exercises that can be helpful for headaches if you're experiencing them. First, the tension headache. And what I kind of like to do on this one is you kind of bend over and right at the base of the skull you're going to find right little bones right in here right before it turns into your neck. You're going to hold those with your thumb and you're going to just kind of pressure point that and massage those areas for a couple of minutes. That can also help with some of the um, cervical uh, you know, pain that you may be experiencing. This feels really good. Maybe I'll just stay right here. <laughs> nah. That can be very helpful. You can do that a couple of times a day, maybe to help release some of that tension. Um, as well, it's always nice to have somebody that can massage your shoulders, massage up and down the back of the neck would be helpful. Maybe you can exchange with a coworker. But we also are seeing a lot of sinus issues right now, too, in sinus headaches. And actually, this is a pressure point uh, that some acupuncturists will use with needles that we call acupressure that can help drain some of the sinus pressure out on this exercise. And what we do is we look for the bone structure around the eyes. And what we're going to do is we're going to put pressure right on the eyebrow, right at that base, and just kind of hold it there. Okay, just kind of hold it there and probably for a good minute and then shift down here and then just right below the eye socket here. We're going to press right here on the sinuses and kind of hold that as well too. And that actually can help bring out some of the drainage, make it pretty quick, hopefully so that you're going to be experiencing less sinus pain and release some of the pressure. You sometimes see people will rub right here too. There are some pressure points in this particular area for frontal lobe types of headaches that can actually alleviate as well. Oftentimes we forget to breathe though and get oxygenation, especially with stress. So one of my favorite exercises is for you to breathe in through your nose and exhale through your mouth, holding your tongue up all the way to your roof of your mouth. So you're going to breathe in, hold it for about 10 seconds, and let the air out slowly. Now we don't want to hyperventilate, and we want to do it kind of slow. But if you can do that for a couple of minutes, a couple of times a day, that can help oxygenate the brain and maybe help alleviate some of the stress as well. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you.
Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Turciano. Ralph. Thank you for that intro. Well, you want to save the lives of a million children worldwide per year? Well, according to a new study by the Cochrane researchers, there's an easy way to do it. And it's very simple. It's just called the supplementation of vitamin A. The Cochrane researchers said they strongly endorse the continuation of vitamin A programs, which reduce the incidence of measles and diarrhea, which ultimately save lives. What they did is they reviewed 43 trials looking at over 215,000 children and realized by supplementing with vitamin A between infancy and five years of age, it reduced the risk of all, and I don't say some, all causes of death by 24%. Compare any vaccine or any vaccine program whatsoever to just something as simple as adding vitamin A to their system. And they said, overall, giving vitamin A capsules reduced the risk of death from any cause by 24% compared to a placebo. And they said, this equates to saving the lives of almost a million children per year. They said, giving vitamin A is associated with a reduction in the incidence of diarrhea and measles, as well as the number of child deaths due to these diseases, which I find quite amazing. In the United States, we're recommending against the use of vitamin A supplementation with our population while the rest of the world is recommending for vitamin A supplementation, not only with children, but also pregnant women to reduce the risk of all causes of death. Something really interesting that you may want to look at talking to your doctor about, but review the facts, not just pure speculation. And now we come down to depressed individuals. Well, you remember a little while ago, we looked at depressed people and they found that it may not be so much a serotonin issue as much as an inflammation issue. Well, this coming from the December issue of Archives of General Psychiatry. What they discovered is today's society or modern society may be too clean. They said rates of depression in younger people have steadily grown to outnumber rates of depression in the older population. And researchers think it may be because of loss of healthy bacteria. Again, this is from the December issue of Archives of General Psychiatry. According to the authors, the modern world has become so clean, we are now deprived of the bacteria our immune systems came to rely over long ages to keep inflammation at bay. And they said, we have also known for a long time people with depression, even those who are not sick, have higher levels of inflammation. Since ancient times, these benign organisms, microorganisms I should say, were often referred to as old friends. They knew about it thousands of years ago, something we forgot about until just recently today. They have taught our immune system to tolerate other harmless microorganisms normally, and the process reduced inflammation that has become linked to the development of modern diseases from cancer to depression. And they said, quote, if the administration of these old friends and beneficial bacteria improves the depression, the authors conclude, then basically they made a major advance in far as a very common disease in a lot of individuals. Now, you want to protect your children from getting asthma? Well, this study, I want to say, was done in three major colleges, Harvard Medical School, Boston, University of Tsukuba, Japan, and University of Birmingham, United Kingdom. You want to reduce the risk of your child getting asthma, which has increased sharply over the past few decades? Get the flu. They have now provided what they say is concrete evidence in animals to support the idea and identified the underlying mechanism to explain the protection which the flu gives your child from protecting them from asthma later on in life. In the study, the infection of mice with influenza A protected the mice as adults in a model of asthma, meaning influenza A protected them from asthma later on. Protection was associated with the expansion of an immune cell or a subset of immune cells known as NKT. Importantly, NKT cells mediated protection in the model of asthma studied and can be induced by treating mice with either the flu, ironically, Helicobacter pylori. Something to think about as time goes on. The flu may be something that's necessary for children to catch in order to modulate the immune system later on. Maybe something that the government program should think about what's more important, 
sick for three or four days, or asthma the rest of your life. Now, talking about the rest of life, we spend more time sick now than a decade ago. This out of December issue of Journal of Gerontology. What a 20-year-old can expect is to live one less healthy year over his lifespan than a 20-year-old a decade ago, even though life expectancy has grown. And they said, the period of life spent with serious disease or loss of function and mobility has actually increased in the last few decades. And this is not because of people living longer. This is because you're healthy less years. What they said, while people might expect to live more years with disease simply as a function of living longer, in general, the researchers show that the average number of healthy years has decreased since 1998. We spend fewer years of our lives without disease even though we live longer. In short terms, a male 20 year old, the 20-year-old male in 1998 could expect to live another 45 years without disease. So basically, we would not start getting sick about, until about the age of 65. Today, a 20-year-old man would only spend about 43.8 healthy years. What that means is they'll start getting sick at about 63 and three-quarter years. Not a tremendous advance for medicine we should talk about, and especially not as far as keeping people healthy. Immobility, well, a 20-year-old would expect to only spend, 1998 would only have 3.8 years with mobility issues, arthritis and things along those lines. A 20-year-old today will spend about 5.8 years with mobility issues, not being able to get up and down on their own, out of bed, the whole lineup. We are living longer, but we are living more sick years than ever before. And the authors conclude, there's substantial evidence we have done little to date to eliminate or delay disease while we prevented death from diseases. From 1998 to 2006, cardiovascular disease and both of, and cancer and diabetes have all increased dramatically over the age of 30. And not only that, the proportion of the population with multiple diseases has also increased dramatically. Something to think about, living longer, but not living healthier. And as a side note, instructions and over-counter the medication. What the, 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 the December 1st issue of JAMA, they looked at cough syrups, anti-diarrhea medicines, everything else like that. They found that out of these OTC medications that represented the 99% of the market, 99% had directions on the bottle's labels and dose markings on the device that did not match. 99% of the medicines produced for children do not match the dose from the bottle to the little spoon they put inside the box. Well, thank you very much, and that will conclude it. Excellent, Ralph. Thank you very much. We appreciate you watching the show. Research, learn. Thank you.